And Nick Christabel is telling us we should just get the get the party started here, and then I can I can add our other presenter in um, as we need to if that works for you. Um, yeah, that works. Um, all right, I can sort of get things started. Yeah, so I'll just run through introductions again, I guess. <laughs> uh, my name is Nick. I'm one of our co-moderators co for this panel. I'm a graduate student in the Department of Human Physiology. Uh, and hopefully you're here for the panel of Human Behavior, I Am What I Am. And I think I just want to again thank everybody for joining this session and also for the coordinators and the presenters for the symposium for changing the layout of this entire symposium to transfer it to an online format in such a short amount of time. It's really impressive. Um, we are in a tight schedule though, so I'll get things started. My only reminder is just to make sure that if you are not presenting, that you mute yourself during the presentation and you can hold your questions till our discussion period. That'll be after each, pre after each presentation, we'll have about eight minutes. Um, with that, though, I'll let us begin our panel with our first presenters who will be presenting on how does background, how does social background, or how does background, background influence social output. So I'll give a warm Zoom welcome to our first presenters. Okay. You guys can see everything, right? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire Amistoso. I'm Catherine Paulus. I'm Brian Salazar. I'm Owen Morgan. And our research question is, how does our background influence our social output? For our study, we define social output as the way we present ourselves in society, what groups we, we are a part of, and how we interact in those groups. Oh. That's the thing. There it goes. We divided a person's background into four subsections. These subsections are language, socioeconomic status, gender, and race and ethnicity. We believe these are the most important aspects of a person's background. We want to see how these categories influence how someone presents themselves in society. We also want to see if there is any intersectionality between sections. Our study targeted UO students ages 17 to 22. Our study was a self-reported survey that participants answered. We had 37 participants. However, we omitted four participants due to outliers in age. Therefore, the results you will see are from 33 participants. Due to the coronavirus, we had to distribute our survey via our Instagram and Snapchat accounts. All right, hi guys, my name is Brian Salazar again. So to start things off, my topic is all about language. And the main question that I want to delve into about language is how does your language background impact your life? We all can agree that everyone around the world is different in their own right. We all, we all have traits that define us and we take that around us wherever we go. For something like language, I want to view the basic essentials of one's use of language and how it is affecting their everyday lives. I want to focus on aspects on their lives that can be seen as important to them and how it has defined them. So from topics like family, work, school, and even, and even our friends, I want, I want to know more about how the, how the individual thinks about themselves for knowing another language and do, they see it, and do they see it as either a positive or negative thing. So when I started with the survey, were simple questions just to get to know what type of um, language a lot of people who were taking the survey used. So some good example would be like, what is your primary language? And you see the examples right there. Where do you, where do you best use your primary language? which I believe the three factors right there were the main factors that a lot of people would use a language. But as the survey went on, I started to ask more scenario and personal questions, just so that I can start to understand how people feel about their own language or the languages that they learned. Like, so what primary language, so good example would be leaving someone behind out of a friend group because they speak another language. Being treated differently because of the language that you speak, leaving someone behind of, of a friend group because they speak another language. And feeling and feeling isolated because of your language, the numbers on the situation the numbers on the situational questions were ranked from one being highly unlikely and five being very likely. So with these results, the majority were the majority we were given were those that don't have a problem with their language. 
But what I do find interesting is that there are, is that there are those that feel the opposite. As you can see with a couple of people feeling like neutral and so on, so three, four, and five. And it is something that and it is something that I very am glad to see. It shows that there are people that do feel affected by learning the language, and it's something I am glad to see. It is it is a good first step as to understanding more about language and how it affects your social output. Hi, my name is Owen Morgan and my specific focus is uh, socioeconomic status. So I first asked what question people, or sorry, I first asked uh, what class people identify with to get an overall sense um, of what socioeconomic status people filling out the survey were a part of. Um, with no surprise, the majority identified as middle class, with the next largest being upper middle. And this is actually pretty reasonable because um, the survey takers were college students. Um, the first question I asked, or so, never, sorry. Uh, how often people shop for themselves is a good indicator of socioeconomic status because shopping for yourself indicates that you have extra cash to spend. Um, if I were to do the survey again, um, I would probably make the options more specific because never, not often, sometimes, often, and all the time, uh, don't don't really like like it can vary from person to person. Um, however, ninety three percent of people chose not often, sometimes, and often, which is probably pretty representative of um, reality. So, uh, asking if people drove a car in high school and by the means of which they drove a car, I think, is a good indicator of social of socioeconomic status. Um, the majority of responses said that they drove their own car, uh, which is not a surprise. Um, and this makes sense due to the majority of responses being middle or upper middle class. Um, asking how many times a year people or people's families go on vacation does indicate socioeconomic status because vacations mean people have spare time and money. Um, no one answered as many vacations as possible, which probably means that option was not one worth asking. Um, the norm was one vacation a year, which is probably standard across um, all American citizens. Uh, and then finally asking how often people go out to eat um, can vary from person to person because so many variables go into this. Uh, whether people have extra money or not, whether people would rather cook than go out or if people are even capable of cooking goes into how often people go out to eat. Um, I find it interesting that only 70% of people chose to go out to eat only once a week. Um, going into the survey, I expected this to be a lot higher considering there are 21 meals in a week, seven days of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So yeah. About two thirds of our participants identified as female and about one third identified as male. Um, however, we also did ask if um, people identified as transgender or other and left that open. However, our participants only chose these two options. For the gender section, I asked participants to rate how strongly they agree or disagree with statements regarding how they, how they would interact according to their gender. I used a one to five Likert scale with one equaling strongly disagree and one e and five equaling strongly agree. As you can see, there was a diversity of answers for this section. This shows that gender is portrayed differently from person to person. For example, the third statement, the gender of the person I am talking with affects how I talk to them. I originally thought that people would disagree with this statement, but after looking at the data, I began to rethink my hypothesis. The data showed that the gender of the person you are talking with really does affect how you interact with them, even if you might think that this shouldn't matter. We also chose to look at race and ethnicity as a potential factor for social output. And similar to the previously mentioned categories across all of the um, sections, five questions created were created with the same agree disagree scale. Um, and it was grouped by section and then centered around like social interactions, um, like elevator encounters, like um, being in the grocery store and like talking to people in line, like situations like that. Um, and within the survey, there were, for this specific category, there was a write-in section for what race or ethnicity like somebody um, identified best with. 
I think the closest to. Um, we weren't sure what the results of the data would show because we weren't sure what the amount of data we could collect would be. Um, but after categorizing the data for similar answers that Google surveys thought was like similar, like for example, if it was the same like category, but it was like an uppercase versus a lowercase, Google read that differently. So we had to combine all of those and see what the results would be, like spaces, things like that. Um, and this graph represents the data of all the entire respondents and then with the outliers removed. So as you can see, we have a wide like, range of like smaller categories, but then a majority of the respondents were white. And here are some of the graphs for the different responses. As you can see, there's a wide range of answers. And although we don't have time to go through like every single response in detail, the response for the question on the next slide has a very interesting response pattern, I think. Um, and answers um, like if participants were in, a, were in a coffee shop and like what they think their social interactions would be. So as you can see from these examples though, like they're just, these questions were based on like daily social interactions that a majority of people, especially on college campuses come in contact with. And here's that question. You are hanging out in a coffee shop and a person asks you for directions. Would you be more inclined to respond to a person who uses the same pronunciation as you? Uh, as seen in the beginning of the section, a majority of the responses to a survey were right, and many of the categories only had one response recorded. So it's possible to have like a comprehensive analysis of the categories. What I did notice though is between the right category, there was a range of very diverse answers with 11 responses from the category said one, six of the respondents said two, eight from the category said three, and there was one response um, who responded four and one response who responded five. Uh, as you can see from the graph, compared to the graphs on the previous slide, this graph is spread out more in its answers. To summarize, the daily social interactions that every individual has can be influenced by a variety of factors in their background. Thus, our data showed that the gender and socio economic diversity in the sections, along with the um, race and ethnicity and linguistic backgrounds, there's no consensus in the answers and the intersection plays a major role for looking at how people interact with others. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can all send our thumbs ups and our claps <laughs> um, in the chat. Yeah, excellent, excellent job. Um, Right, we are open for questions now, and I think we had a question posted in the chat, so I will try and see if I can pull that up. Um, okay, yeah, from Justin, we have, did you find any correlation between socioeconomic status and feeling isolated due to language? Um, so I guess I'll open that up to any of our presenters. Um, we didn't really find much correlation uh, between socioeconomic status and like feeling like necessarily feeling isolated due to language. Um, like our, our data didn't really um, get that deep into that, but I'm sure like in the real world, maybe people with a lower socioeconomic status might be more socially isolated um, in America. Brian, and, you and I, yeah, and I, to go on, to, to go along with that, mind you, um, a lot when looking at the data between the language and social economic status, um, from from what we have here on uh, like questions like how often do you shop for yourself or did you drive a car in high school, a majority of the questions were just were were a lot of the, a lot of the answers were a lot more positive. Like you do have a lot of people saying that they sometimes go shopping for themselves or they do often go. Um, shopping for themselves, or they do drive their own car, having that that sort of that, having that sort of independence to themselves, and I think that kind of way kind of reflects upon how people feel about themselves and i.e. their language, because from what I've shown from my data, um, it is highly skewed to the left. I mean, meaning like a lot of people do feel confident with themselves, um, with the language that they have, and and all these different types of scenarios. So, yeah, I would yeah, um, I totally agree with Owen. Where it's like doesn't this, it doesn't really in a way kind of it doesn't really in a way kind of correlate to them being isolated but it does and it does kind of um reflect upon like the amount of independence you have the amount of positivity that you see yourself doing because of that you can just look at you can just look at scenario questions like i have like do you feel isolated do you feel um like you don't like your language and all that 
a lot of people with that type of independence would just kind of just shrug that aside and just have quite have answers like oh highly unlikely i don't really feel that way i kind of feel good with what i have and all that yeah okay um i think uh megan do you have a question what's in chat do you? um i in another life was a social scientist so i always love thinking about uh this type of research and i think you found some really interesting findings um i had kind of a research methods question um thinking about sort of socioeconomic status and how you chose to have participants self-identify i think often uh, when we think about socioeconomic status or at least income um we think about it in these very quantitative terms of like, how much do you make compared to your household size? Um, and it was interesting that you chose to have people self-identify based on a number of um, other factors. So it's kind of curious about sort of the thinking that went into um, choosing to represent socioeconomic status in that way. Yeah, so um, I didn't want to like actually ask people like how much money like around how much money do your parents make or do you make right um i feel like that'd be a little uh invasive just because it's like it's just like a survey to them um and then also uh identifying with the class i think is a lot different than um the reality of the class that you're in because like um for example like myself like when i was a younger kid uh growing up i thought i was just um in the middle class and like I didn't and I, like I wasn't aware of like uh my privilege around me and it took me a while to realize I was in the upper middle class so um when you identify like asking people how they identify with a class um it looks more at how they look at the world rather than like the actual numbers around um around what class they're in so yeah Great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, if nobody else has any questions, I have one. Um, okay. So, yeah, I'm interested to know how you think our current pandemic situation may have affected some of your results from your questions about social output, given our kind of really strange situation right now around new social protocols. Um, do you think that, um, or I guess so I have a two part maybe even. Um, so you said that you changed the methodology somewhat given our um, remote situation. So um, do you know what the original plan was for delivering the survey or what you would have done? So I guess it's the first one. And then the second one is just, yeah, how do you think our situation right now could be affecting people's social outputs? have um, uh, yeah so the first one so our original um, research method was we were going to um, like send out this survey um, via our social media accounts like we did um, however um, we were going to also kind of pick out some um, people like individually and interview them just to get um, a kind of more in-depth scope of like uh, maybe different um, people's backgrounds and how they personally um, like socially interact in them and how like maybe around campus how they present themselves. So we were going to do in-person interviews um, and we scratched that part due to online learning because we were thinking like maybe not a lot of people want like necessarily want to do a video chat with us or like maybe since they don't know us that well, it would have been like really awkward to do that. Um, and then for the second question, um, I think like for, for me personally, like the gender part um, and maybe people um, interacting or kind of interacting with other according to their gender. Um, I, I think without like with more, more personal interactions, we, I think we could have seen um, maybe, I think maybe it could have been a little more, um, like, I think there would have been more diverse answers, uh, despite like this section being really diverse already. 
um, just maybe because like we don't get a lot of um, outside interaction in our homes. So maybe like people would have thought of their, like rethought of their questions and their answers to those questions. And just something to add on to like the very first part is just like, and when we were originally planning to interview people, like through the interviews, we might have come across different variables through the interviews that would have like um, allowed us to like reevaluate the way we asked the questions or like realize that there's more underlying layers to as opposed to just like sending them a survey and just seeing like what their responses would be and how we could evaluate them. Yeah, yeah it'd be really interesting to know almost like what a follow-up survey would be in the next four or five months and see how people's um, responses might have changed after being <laughs> socially isolated for <laughs> however long, however long it's going to end up being. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I think that's all I have for questions. There are no more from the guests, then I say we give one more little virtual round of applause to our first presenters. Um, okay, but we can move on to our next presenter. I believe that's Maggie. Um, yeah, I will cede the floor. Awesome. Can everyone see and hear me okay? Gorgeous. Okay, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen with y'all right now. And let's pull up my presentation. Get this guy getting ready to present it. I can't present it with this thing in the way. Yay! Okay, this is my pride and joy. I'm very proud of this. Uh, without further ado, this is Outlasting the Binary, an analysis of gender and queer representation in Outlast 2. It won't let me skip. There we go. I have a couple short disclaimers that I'd like to address before we get started. Outlast 2 is rated M for a reason, very graphic in terms of its content, so I would like to state that if the following points on this slide trigger you or make you upset, I would suggest to tune out my presentation. This is my second disclaimer. There's a lot to unpack with this game and I could go on about it forever, but I only have so much time to present, so I'm not going to be going as in depth as I would like. If you'd like to know more about it, I would suggest you read my entire paper that I plan on posting to Scholars Bank. So horror titles seem to utilize a lot of first person perspectives, uh, giving the option to either fight your attacker and in Outlast, this is taken away, which adds another big component to fear in that you're only given the option to run and hide. And that is the reason why I picked this game is because it's unique from other horror titles. In this analysis, I argue that the common themes in horror media, while effective, have an adverse effect on the communities that they represent. And before I get started with that, I would like to also mention my literature review in which researchers found that in analysis of gender and queer representation in video games, men are seen to be more aggressive and hostile, whereas women are seen to be more submissive and weak. And in including queer representation, it's pretty much non-existent. Um, most queer individuals in video games are seen as NPCs, which stand for non-playable characters, or their sexuality is glorified as their only trait. My methodology for this game was I played out last two on a Nintendo Switch console, both in story mode to allow myself to collect all the recordings and documents that you find in the game that I then analyzed. And then I played it again on normal mode to experience the full nature of the gameplay, what actually made it scary. My gameplay totaled at about 10 hours and 54 minutes. I also uh, took through a lot of online walkthroughs and let's plays to get a feel for how the differing difficulties changed anything in the gameplay in terms of its content, which it didn't. Now, before I move on to my actual analysis and plot, I would like to discuss the developers of the game, because without them, this obviously would not be possible. <laughs> so Red Barrels is a independent video game company with headquarters located in Montreal, Canada. It's founded by senior game designer David Chateau, uh, senior artist Hugo Delaire, and senior game designer Philip Morin, who had all designed games like Ubisoft and Assassin's Creed. So this is my plot. Uh, you play as Blake Langerman, a cameraman working with your investigative wife, Lynn. You are both looking for clues to lead to the seemingly impossible murder of a woman named Jane Doe. The investigation leads you miles into the Arizona desert, specifically a cult called Temple Gate, to an investigation so deep that no light could be shed upon it and a corruption so profound that going mad may be the only sane thing to do. 
It's very, very charming. So before I get into the analysis, I would like to discuss oh, the- cool. <laughs> That's cool. Um, I don't know why my recording went off on that, but those are my two, <laughs> those are my two theories, which was hegemonic masculinity and emphasized femininity and ambivalent sexism theory. I would like to now open this discussion about emphasized femininity with Lynn Langerman, who is the investigative journalist. She fits into the uh, bossy female stereotype. And that bossy female stereotype basically talks about how if women were to exhibit certain masculine qualities, such as ambition or leadership, especially in the context of a workplace, they are seen as bossy. Lynn is introduced as a strong female character, verbally assaulting and even retaliating at her attackers up until her capture by the heretics, which are another religious group in the game. In her capture, she transgresses into both the image of the terrified woman and the image of the damsel in distress, which are two commonly seen tropes in horror games. The player can see Lynn turn into a damsel in distress near the second half of the game where you can hear her calling for Blake for help. Lynn's transgression for being a strong female lead into the damsel in distress shows that she was forced to conform to tropes of being weak, submissive, and needing a male to rescue her. Uh, Blake is perceived to be the underdog of the game. It's mentioned in an official document in the Outlast universe titled Heaven's Gate Subjects that Blake is not exactly a hero but can take a lot of punishment. It's not meant that he's supposed to be the rugged hero. However, he's the contrasting archetype to the terrified woman titled the male protector. Blake tra traverses through unknown territory and unsuspecting danger at every turn. There is also a checkpoint among many that you get in the game, the first of which is titled Find Lynn. And his commentary states, nothing matters but Lynn. And this is very endearing, but Blake's commentary signifies that based on these theories of hegemonic masculinity and emphasized femininity, women are weak, submissive, and require men to come to their rescue. In addition, Blake risks everything for the safety of his wife, even offering her physical protection by shielding her from the villains of the game. So while Blake is the male protector, he influences hegemonic masculinity as being the savior to the terrified woman, forcing Lynn to fall into that weak and submissive trope that was discussed in ambivalent sexism theory. And I should mention ambivalent sexism theory, since my slides so nicely decided to try and say it for me, was that ambivalent sexism theory puts these negative and positive connotations on the stereotypes of men and women. Men are seen as leaderly and strong while also being seen as aggressive and hostile towards other men whereas women are seen as soft and likable and also as weak and submissive. With the time I have left, I would like to talk about the evil and androgyny as specifically a character named Val in Outlast 2. So some brief background on this character. Val was the chief deacon of Templegate who then splintered from that testament to form the heretics. And the biggest connotation of their androgyny is their pronouns. So out of the to total 54 collectible documents, I counted Val's name versus the amount of pronouns that were used. Val's, men Val's name, excuse me, was mentioned 21 times in a total of five documents, whereas their pronouns were only used twice, once in each document. Their pronouns were also used once in dialogue. One example is seen in chapter 11 of the Gospel of Noth, where any mention of Val was in third person. So it's kind of already seen in the game that Val's gender is meant to be ambiguous. However, this ambiguousness is kind of combated by the fact that Val has presentable masculine features, such as high cheekbones, a strong jaw, and a flat chest. What's interesting to mention is that Val is pronounced as a more masculine character, yet their voice actor is female, and her name is Claudia Besso. Including that, their masculinity is further negated by the second half of the game, titled Leviticus Val's Rebirth, in which you approach them and they are completely naked, covered in mud, but you can see that they have a breasts and a female reproductive system. So when asked by fans on Twitter about Val's gender, Red Barrels responded with Val is Val. And while this may seem as developers giving an answer because the gender of the character doesn't really matter in context of the gameplay or context of the storyline, the mannerisms and demeanor of Val may be representative of negative stereotypes seen in androgynous villains in horror games. So Val is shown to embrace negative sexual stereotypes surrounding gender non-conforming characters, the biggest being sexual ferocity in which Val sexually assaults Blake and Lynn. Their further gender ambiguity is also seen in their mannerisms in which Val is seen in the second half of the game to be female bodied, but they also sway their hips in a feminine slash sexual manner towards Blake near the game. While it's not seen in game that Val's potential death was because of their gender variance, the ambiguousness of their gender and their feminine displays were seen as abnormal to the other non-playable characters, which signified that their gender variance should be seen as something negative or odd. 
Val's sexual aggression is their main point of villainy, and that is to say that Val is the most physically intimate antagonist in the game, leaving that feature to stick with the player and then unnerve them. This trope not only unnerves the player, but also influences the stereotype seen in gender variant villains of sexual ferocity. When comparing gender variant villains in other horror titles to Val, I've concluded that the notion of androgyny or gender variance is shown to be a form of punishment or an excuse to negatively stigmatize those in the queer community by being sexually predatory towards other characters. The analysis of this character supports my presumption that their gender nonconformity is used to confuse and make the player uncomfortable, along with, of course, Val's sexual advances. This discomfort with Val's mannerisms and overall physical being are then depicting that gender variance as something to be uncomfortable towards or something to see as a villainous trope. These are my limitations in my future research. One limitation was my extension of my gameplay due to deaths. I didn't say I was a good gamer, I just said I gamed. So on my story mode, I died a total of two times, and on normal mode, I died a total of seven. My gameplay wasn't increased due to the analyzation of the recordings or documents because I did not do that in game. I waited until the main menu screen where I was able to access them all at the same time. Further directions of this research include a further analysis of this series. This is, of course, the second of the first game and the downloadable content titled Outlast Whistleblower. I would like to discuss further gender disparities in that title as well. Another theme to research is the more well-known proponent fears to in horror games, and that includes fears like stigmatizing mental health, fat phobia, a further discussion of sexually transmitted diseases used in other, um, I don't know why my PowerPoint did that, I apologize, <laughs> as well as other proponents to fear in horror games. One last direction I would like to take is to collect and pursue and analyze gendered fear responses to horror games via YouTube Let's Plays. This game had a lot of um, quote unquote gendered deaths in this game. And I really wanted to experience whether or not are men more likely to physically react to the protagonist's death, which is fairly gruesome, than women are. And um, I, I assume that this would be a much longer uh, study to do. It would take me much more than a term, but it's a direction I'd like to follow nonetheless. I would like to acknowledge some people before I end my presentation. Thank you to my advisor, Kemi Balligan, who is here today. I appreciate you being here. Thank you to the University of Oregon Undergraduate Research Committee for hosting this. Thank you to the Knight Library librarians and staff for taking time and looking at all of my resources. Thank you to Red Barrels for raising my questions when I asked them, I'm sure it was very annoying. Thank you to my family and friends, here are my references, and also thank you to my boyfriend, Eric, who could not be here. And that is the end of my presentation. Hey, awesome <laughs> job. Thank you. Um, I think we have a question that was posted in chat um, <laughs> right from Brian. Uh, since this is the sequel to the original, did the original share any of the similar themes to this? That's a really good question. So the big disparity between the first title and the second title is the first title does not have any women at all. And that is, of course, due to mechanisms within the game. It's very confusing. There's a corporation and it's, you know, you know, funny stuff, funny government stuff. In this game, you can see that the first title has nothing but men, which I could still obviously sit and drone about hegemonic masculinity in horror titles, especially the trope of the male savior, the stigmatization of mental health, because the first game does take place in an asylum. But as I mentioned, the reason why I took this second game, and I mentioned this in my paper, is you can see there's a very large disparity of females in horror games. You can tell that females are obviously mistreated, they're seen as disposable, or they're seen as objects of sexual gratification or a prize that the male protector then has to go and rescue or pursue. And I feel as though this game specifically really hones in on that, even if it's implicitly, because obviously the character's not gonna say, I'm a damsel in distress, come rescue me. It's more so of a, um, it's an implicit thing, and that's why I found it so interesting, is because it's not exactly in your face. I had to dig very deep in order to find these hegemonic tropes within the game that weren't obvious, of course, such as in dialogue and such. Thank you for your question. <laughs> um, I think we have, we have multiple questions in chat. I think uh, Megan, you had one? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your presentation. I think I haven't seen too many um, presentations on video games. So it's really exciting to see that um, coming in as sort of a medium to work with. Um, I So I don't have a ton of background in sort of critical theory and gender, but I'm curious, um, 
So it seems to me like maybe horror video games are nestled within this larger horror genre, I mean, movies, books, um, I'm sure plenty of other things. How do you feel like, um, this is a big question, <laughs> but video game, how do you feel like video games kind of nestle within that? And do you feel like there's um, kind of space within for the horror as a video game to kind of play with any of those tropes or subvert them? Or do you find like they kind of align with existing tropes? That's a really good question. Um, I'm hoping that I'm interpreting it correctly. Uh, so video games in general or like horror media, in my paper, I mentioned that horror media is in itself already totally within the gender binary. They discuss a lot of these tropes. You see them in horror movies all the time. The only remaining difference between movies and video games is obviously with video games, you are playing the character. When you're watching a movie, you're just watching everything happen and you can't control what's going on. And while video games still have those restrictions by like, you have to follow the storyline, you are allowed to openly explore. And that's what this game does is it forces you to explore and find these documents and recordings because they're not out in the open for you. With that being said, I do think that me bringing these points up and other researchers bringing these points up of, you know, what, you're, what this game obviously leads to is that men are supposed to be protecting women or that women are supposed to be seen as prizes, something weak and submissive. And I feel as though offering that narrative can then lead to developers specifically, since I talk about horror media within video games, but also this could lead out to directors and other um, consumers, people who make video games, people who make horror media, they would see this narrative and think, okay, how can we either bring forth this narrative and offer it in the video game to state like, hey, this is obviously something terrible. And that's actually done in the video game too, which I discussed in my paper and I couldn't discuss in the presentation. But I'm hoping that with this discussion, with my narration and with other social science research, including the gender binary in horror media, we can find that these can be taken away. I mean, another point that I make in my paper is that a lot of horror media doesn't have female leads. And I feel as though that, again, leads into that discussion of emphasized femininity where women are seen as weak and submissive. They can't handle themselves if a giant male monster were to come up and attack them. And I feel as though that's totally untrue. Women are pretty badass, I feel, and I feel like they can defend themselves. Long story short, I do feel like my narrative would hopefully either bring forth this uh, further narrative of gender binary in video games or even take it away and allow developers to play with these ideas of let's have a female lead or let's have a non-binary lead or let's see where this goes. I feel like it would be very good for consumers as well because then there would be equal representation in people who buy the games. Okay, um, I think and we have a question from Kimi in chat. Yeah. How do you think your research speaks to the existing literature on gender, sexuality, and video games? Ooh, of course you would ask me a question. That's hard. <laughs> um, I feel as though my research is going to offer things that I feel as though are already thoroughly discussed in terms of that we're already well aware that video games have this gender disparity of like men play more video games than women which I don't think is, I'd have to look at the data again because I do believe I've seen a statistic before. And I feel as though what my research has done is give a narrative, but it's a narrative that's interesting because as Megan had said, there isn't a lot of research that concerns video games. It's always about um, analyzing media like movies or books. And adding this extra narrative of, yes, obviously we're well aware that horror has these terrible stereotypes. These, this is different. These people are playing the game. They are, they're immersing themselves as a character and they become attached to the character as they play. And I feel as though that offering this narrative to further or to supporting research is going to kind of put a twist on the theories and things that have already been discussed with horror media and further state, this is even more important to discuss now because the player feels this connection with the main player and they can then see these disparities and things as they play. And I hope I answered that question correctly. I'm using a lot of big words. <laughs> Okay, um, I don't think we have any more questions in chat, so I'll just have my question. Um, do you think, what do you think the effect is of the interactive element of video games on the impact of this presentation of hegemonic masculinity? Because I think of, you know, 
the effect of horror films and their presentation, similar presentations of hegemonic masculinity and what effect that has. But I think you kind of touched on this already in the last question though, but they have this interactive element because if you're viewing a film, you're receiving the content, but you're not interacting with it in the same way that you would be as if you were the video game player and you're actually engaging with the content. So what do you think the effect of that is on this hegemonic masculinity presentation? It's a really, it's a really good question. And I've, I've kind of battered with it myself because I feel as though, you know, why is this interaction important? Mm -hmm. And a really good example that I'd like to bring up is in the game, uh, Blake gives commentary on a specific recording where he states, they always hurt women to punish men. It's sick and it's cowardly. And that right there is not only Blake being aware of like the mistreatment of women and the hegemonic structures within Templegate, but it also places that narrative within the character's mind who is playing as Blake. So while they may see this scene and they're like, this is disgusting, they're not necessarily thinking of like, why is this happening? Like, what are the, what are the structures within this community that are forcing these women to be thoroughly mistreated? Is it because horror media sits on these hegemonic tropes? Is it because the community that the game is within? You know, it, it basically just adds these discussion points that when you're watching a movie, you don't really pick up on because again, you're, you're trying to immerse yourself in everything that's going on along with character interactions, the, the um, environment that they're in on top of the remaining storyline. Whereas when you're playing as a, the character, you're really mo mostly focused on yourself. You're focused on what you need to do, what environments you need to be in and honing in on that one interaction, that one interaction between yourself and the character, lets you think on these hegemonic narratives and these narratives about the mistreatment of women more thoroughly rather than it just kind of being spoken of, but then you forget it because something else scary happened. Yeah. Yeah, and especially since you mentioned you have the first person element to it, that exactly. the character can really become a, like a vessel for your own experience. Exactly. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Um, Okay, let's give one more little virtual round of applause. Um, yeah, really, really good job. Thank you, I appreciate um, it. <laughs> I have my family clapping outside. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, uh, Megan, did we ever get Nolan in chat or John? Um, okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, let me see. Uh, Kayla, would you be um, ready to go up next or? Here, let me share my screen. All right. So I did this research as part of my uh, Clark Honors College thesis. And so um, I'm looking at post-stroke dysphagia's impact on survivors and spousal caregivers, and I'll explain what that is. Um, so as the population of the United States and the rest of the world rapidly ages, a growing number of um, people will experience age-related illnesses such as stroke. And unfortunately, stroke is a very common cause of swallowing difficulties called dysphagia. Some signs of dysphagia are the inability to control saliva or food in the mouth and coughing during or after eating. And it's estimated that up to two thirds of stroke survivors experience dysphagia in at least the acute stage of their recovery. And that in half of these survivors, dysphagia persists for at least six months. The complications of dysphagia are not only physical, but are also social in nature. Um, those with dysphagia often experience decreased social participation and increased anxiety and depression as a result of their condition. Because of these additional um, social impacts, dysphagia contributes not only to the physical and financial costs of the chronic illness, but also the psychosocial costs, dramatically impacting mortality and quality of life. Following a stroke, a patient may be discharged directly from the hospital to their family residence, and in this case, a relative often acts as their primary caregiver. This shift in role from relative to primary caregiver and the increased demands of um, being placed on these individuals can lead to significant caregiver burden. Caregiver burden is defined as any additional emotional, financial, or physical stress a person endures as a result of caring for another person. And nearly 44 million Americans serve as caregivers of older adults or individuals with disabilities each year. One framework used to describe um, spousal health interdependence in response to chronic illness 
um, is the World Health Organization's International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health. Um, they have a definition of third-party disability, which is disability in caregivers and family members that uh, directly results uh, from a loved one's chronic illness. Uh, this concept situates caregivers not just as supporters of the health of their loved one, but as patients in their own right. Um, this chart shows a model of third-party disability for a dyad, or two people, experiencing dysphagia. A care recipient's body functions, activities, and participation in everyday life are affected by their dysphagia symptoms, as well as the context of their environment, as well as personal factors. Then, their caregiver experiences third-party disability as a result of the care recipient's dysphagia, which impacts how their body functions and which activities they participate in. The caregiver's ability to provide care to the care recipient then becomes a contextual factor impacting the um, environment and personal factors um, that impact the dysphagia symptoms of the care recipient, which creates an interdependent relationship. Another related theory used to analyze and interpret caregiver dyad interaction in response to chronic illness is the dyadic illness management theory. Um, this idea conceptualizes couple dyads as interdependent teams whose main goal is to optimize the health of both partners. Um, the theory consists of two parts, dyadic appraisal and dyadic management. Appraisal is how each partner receive, uh, how each partner perceives the illness, excuse me. Um, it's suggested that the amount of congruence in dyadic appraisal is more important than each individual's separate appraisal of the illness. Dyadic management behavior is how a dyad makes decisions, manages changes in functioning and symptom severity, and goes about uh, care planning. It's been found that increased dyadic congruence in dyadic appraisal are protective factors for positive outcomes in the presence of chronic illness, while decreased dyadic management behaviors and increased incongruence in dyadic appraisal are risk factors for negative outcomes. A growing body of evidence supports dysphagia's independent role in contributing to increased caregiver burden, yet it remains unclear how or why dysphagia increases this burden. Third-party disability, as viewed through the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health Framework and the Dyadic Illness Management Theory, offer insight into this relationship. However, a significant gap in the literature exists in connecting third-party disability and the dyadic illness management theory to caregiver and dyadic outcomes in the context of post-stroke dysphagia. For the purposes of the current study, the focus is on one aspect of this in interaction, um, uh, patient-caregiver incongruence and perceptions of the impact of post-stroke dysphagia on mealtimes. So the goal of this study was to identify the associations between burden and mealtime-related congruence, dysphagia severity, and stroke severity. Um, some of the questions addressed in the study were, what impact does perceptual incongruence have on the degree of caregiver burden in the context of post-stroke dysphagia? And what other factors contribute to dysphagia-specific caregiver burden in this population? The hypothesis was that higher levels of incongruence between partners in their perceived impact of dysphagia on mealtimes would correlate with higher levels of dysphagia-related caregiver burden. So the participants in the study were 27 survivor partner dyads. Um, they were all at least 18 years old and the survivors of strokes had their most recent stroke at least three months prior to participating in the study. Um, they were all married to and living with their primary caregiver. 70% of the spouses and 30% of survivors were female, and the two largest reported race categories were white with 70% for survivors and 74% for spouses, and black with 26% for survivors and 22% for spouses. More spouses than survivors worked full or part-time, and 56% of stroke survivors were retired. The data in the current study um, was collected as part of a larger study exploring the impact of post-stroke dysphagia on family functioning. As part of the larger study, the stroke survivors and spousal caregivers completed surveys containing three primary sections. Um, these are listed in purple on my slide. Um, one, participation or participant demographic information. Two, um, social and logistic mealtime questionnaire. And three, a relationship quality questionnaire. Um, in addition, uh, Stroke survivors alone 
com completed two additional subjective survey sections, the swallowing related quality of life scale or SWALQUAL, which measures perceived levels of dysphagia severity and dysphagia related quality of life. Um, and the stroke impact scale, which is a measure of overall stroke severity. Uh, as for results, there was a moderate incongruence between survivors and spouses perceptions of dysphagia's impact on the logistic and social aspects of mealtimes, um, and neither the survivors nor the spouses consistently reported a greater impact of dysphagia on mealtimes. The hypothesis that higher levels of incongruence between partners in the perceived impact of dysphagia on mealtimes would correlate with higher levels of dysphagia-related caregiver burden was not supported in this study. In fact, a significant negative relationship existed between burden and mealtime logistic congruence. This meant that increased burden was associated with increased agreement in survivor spouse perceptions of dysphagia's impact on the logistic aspects of mealtimes. However, a burden was not associated with mealtime social congruence. The results of the study aligned with prior research into congruence and spousal burden in that it may be easier for couples to agree on symptom impact when the symptoms are more severe, but differed in that incongruence did not directly correlate with increased burden. Because of this, it could be that in a larger sample, incongruence could increase caregiver burden in couples experiencing less severe dysphagia, since incongruence has been shown to increase burden in other studies. As for clinical relevance, for couples who have higher incongruence in their appraisal of the impact of dysphagia on mealtimes, dyadic management skills such as collaboration in decision making and care planning uh, may act as a protective factor against caregiver burden or negative health outcomes for both partners. This is an important relationship for health professionals to understand as they can capitalize on the protective factors present in a particular dyad's specific situation. The theory of dyadic illness management emphasizes the heterogeneity of couple dyads and points out that there is not an average couple. Building on a dyad's strengths while scaffolding the areas of weakness um, should be a goal of intervention in populations with post-stroke dysphagia. For instance, if a couple shows weakness in the area of dyadic appraisal through high incongruence in their perception of symptom severity or symptom impact, a therapist might be able to emphasize the need for shared treatment goals between the partners in order to help lessen their incongruent appraisals. This in turn could encourage dyadic management behaviors such as increased communication, shared decision making, and balanced time spent actively managing the um, condition. More research should be done to better understand the specific contributors of caregiver burden in families affected by post-stroke dysphagia. Specifically, it's important to determine what amount of overall caregiver burden is tied to dysphagia-related burden and what amount is the result of other sources of burden. With larger sample sizes, the relationship between burden and a larger variety of individual and dyadic level variables could be uh, explored, allowing for a clearer picture of the scope of the problem of um, post-stroke dysphagia-related caregiver burden. This research also um, should expand to include dysphagia-related burden in non-spousal caregivers, such as adult children of older adults and um, parents of younger adults with post-stroke dysphagia. There may be specific but patterned differences between the sources and type of burden uh, experienced by these groups. Uh, another uh, fruitful avenue for future research will be quantifying the short and long-term benefits of incorporating patients' care partners in dysphagia management teams. And a better understanding of the longitudinal impact of dyadic health interventions um, designed to improve health outcomes for families touched by post-stroke dysphagia will lead to best practice recommendations that will benefit um, the care of patients with dysphagia and their caregivers and the rest of their family as well. All right, that is what I have. All right, awesome job, Kayla. Send my little clap email. <laughs> Um, okay, I have some questions, but are there any questions in chat or that people have? If not, I can lead us off. I may be a little bit biased because I'm in, in aging physiology research, but I think that was awesome. <laughs> I love looking at the interactions between um, healthcare and physiology and social interactions. It's really interesting. Um, so I guess my uh, question would be, because 
I guess, first of all, did you find, I think there was a difference in the genders of survivors and spouses. Did you see that there was sort of a, a unequal distribution between the genders for survivors? And then I guess off of that, do you think that that could affect the results of this incongruence between the dyads if it was a different gender of the survivor? Yeah, um, there was a pretty big discrepancy. Um, I think, if I remember right, there was 70% of the stroke survivors were male and 30% of the spouses were female. All of the couples in the study were um, heterosexual couples. Um, and I think that that would impact the experience that both partners have on the caring experience because largely the sample existed where there was a wife taking care of her husband. And I think that that inherently has a different um, dynamic than a husband taking care of a wife. And it doesn't have to, but I think in a lot of older adults, it is the case that there's more defined gender roles that would go into that dynamic and might impact um, how some of the data turned out where um, one party thought it was, uh, the dysphagia was impacting mealtimes more than the other, for sure. Yeah, lots of interesting future research directions like based off of just merely the fact that the people who are of the age where they're more at risk for having strokes right now are from a different cultural generation as well. So it'd be interesting to see how spousal interactions change over time based on upbringing. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. And in this study, there was a pretty big age range in the participants. I think the youngest um, stroke survivor participant was 33. Wow. And the oldest was 86. So I think even though there was a big range, it skewed really um, more older adult than younger adult. But um, yeah, I think in the future, looking at those two groups separately would be really interesting. Yeah. And then also uh, you could look at different severity of strokes and what types of cognitive aspects or social emotional aspects are affected in the survivor by the stroke. How do those affect incongruence also? Lots of, lots of really interesting stuff. <laughs> um, do you have any other questions in chat for Kayla? Let's see. Um, okay. If not, then let's say we can give one more round of applause um, for Kayla and all of our presenters today, also. Everybody. Um, yeah, again, just really great job to everybody for um, delivering on your presentations and also keeping the professionalism, even though we're all in this weird <laughs> virtual world. Really great job. Um, Megan, did we, so we didn't get Nolan in the chat, Megan, or we? Uh... I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think they were, they were able to make it for whatever reason, um, unfortunately. I do think, um, if and you were giving a beautiful wrap up, I'm not trying to step on your toes. I think if any, we do have time. So if anybody, if any questions did come up about any of the other presentations, um, or if you have anything else that you wanted to add or say about your presentation, I do think we have time for that. I think I might have actually had, oh yeah, for um, Maggie, I had one more question, I guess, that I don't think I had time for um, originally. I actually just remembered, or I guess it's maybe just like a discussion point, because I remembered, because you mentioned mentioned the character Val yes. in the game, and that reminded me a little bit of um, the film Silence of the Lambs, which has another character who presents as androgynous and is also the villain of the, of the movie, Buffalo Bill, who is a serial killer in the movie. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really, I just realized that, yeah, it's really interesting how there's multiple different kinds of media that kind of utilize that same trope. Um, yes. Actually, when did the game that you played come out, Outlast 2? So Outlast 2 came out in 2017, which I know is much, oh, much wow. later than Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. But it then further, again, emphasizes that those tropes that are seen with gender non-conforming individuals is that they have this narcissistic quality about them. Some of them are sexual aggressive or predatory towards the main characters or other NPCs. 
it's very commonly seen. I, I actually do an analysis with another horror game character called Death Mold, who's from The Witcher 2, I believe, and they are also a gender non-conforming character who are punished for their gender transgressions. Wow, yeah, it's pretty, those are, I think, 26 or so years apart then, 2017 <laughs> versus yeah. Sans Lens. That's a long time, wow. It definitely it's still, shows still very similar. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Oh, I have another question. Yeah. <laughs> since, since we're here. Um, this whole question is also for Maggie. Sorry, we're like peppering you with questions. <laughs> we had some time to like let things think. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and I think I have one for you too, Kayla, if we end up having time. Um, so, yeah, I'm thinking a lot about that you're in this horror genre, um, which is like, is really interesting because I think it is like this really interesting space of like, being able to like take on and embody sort of like negative aggressive things that um in this in this space where it's like doesn't have con like real life consequences which I think is really interesting mm -hmm. um and then I'm also thinking about myself as a queer person and playing games and really not um finding like a, a space or an ability to like see people like my embody people like myself as a player cool. um very different game, but I was been playing Stardew Valley recently during during this. Yeah, you too. That's okay. <laughs> um, and it was really yeah, very very different game. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I think it was really exciting for me to have this character that kind of reflected me as a person, um, and then I was able to like go on and sort of have relationships with other female characters, um, kind of romantic characters with fem romantic relationships with characters in the game. Mm -hmm. um which was a really which was really interesting for me um and it's something i haven't experienced a ton of so i guess i'm thinking and bear with me because this is not a well thought out question but i'm thinking um there seem there's power in being able to embody characters like us right yes. um and being able to sort of play with those conventions and like i was so yeah i guess i'm really interested in the space of like so often it seems like your findings are that the characters that kind of fall outside of this norm are portrayed negatively. Um, and I'm sort of interested in, um, I don't know, in, in people being able to like embody those characters and kind of play out both positive and negative aspects um, and kind of having a more open experience rather than it being like, well, if we put a queer character in here, I feel like there's kind of this movement now where it's like, we put a queer, queer character in, they're gonna be good because we're trying to have like good representation, <laughs> you know? Yes. It seems like the next level is like, well, maybe we should just let them do whatever they exactly. want. And, you yeah. know, that's why there are so many differing types of games to play is because like I mentioned with Nick, you know, video games are still very restrictive. You may be playing as the character and you may be making the decisions, but you are bound to the gameplay, the storyline. There isn't really much you can do unless it's a quote unquote open world game where there's still a storyline, but you don't have to follow it. In this context of this game, you're obviously bound to whatever Blake has to do. And the interactions that he has with the characters are obviously set, they can't change. What I do think is interesting with other video games is giving players the option to choose with whether or not they want their character to be good or bad. I've seen that in a lot of action, um, sorry, action adventure titles do that a lot where you get to choose whether or not you'd like your character to be a vigilante or a villain. And I, I do believe that if um, developers would like to, in a sense, make more money or appease their consumers in a way to add a broader diversity in video games is to, like you mentioned, you know, allow them to be able to pick what they want to do and to be able to fully flesh out the positive and negatives of whatever side you decide to pick. Because it's not only going to add a diverse conversation, but with the negatives, it's going to bring out like, you can see that this is how people view these characters because these developers are forcing these characters to become negative or they're forcing these characters to exhibit these stereotypes that in the gender non-conforming community, they experience every day as actual stereotypes. People actually think gender non-conforming characters are sexually predatory or whatever the case is. And I'm hoping that I'm answering your question in the best way possible. I'm it, was kind a, of it was a weird question, but I think, oh, no. I think I'm getting at it, right? <laughs> where it's like, I feel like for media, we're a long time was like, 
was like non-conforming queer bad and now we've kind of shifted to like look we have all of these different representations but like they're generally good because we're yeah. trying to get away from that and exactly. it's like i'm waiting for the space where we can have like a, a richly defined queer character who is bad or is evil but in ways that don't right. rely on tropes or stereotypes and that's why this research is so important is because it's all it's forcing the developers because I'm a consumer. I bought the game and I played the game. I'm an LGBT person. I understand that playing this game means that I was going to be well aware of the mistreatment of women and the disgusting stereotypes that are shown in this game with the gender non-conforming community. But with this research, it forces the developers to look at it and think, oh, okay, so maybe we implicitly, I really don't think the developers meant to make Val like, look at this gender non-conforming character. Let's slap their wrist. It's mostly just we just wanted to make a character look scary. We weren't realizing the ramifications that would come with making this character gender non-conforming and also exhibiting these negative stereotypes. And I mean, it's research like this that makes developers and consumers think on it more too. Like I'm not, I wasn't really aware of that until now. And here's to hoping that actually helps something. <laughs> uh, thanks, for ta thanks for tackling that. I think, yeah, I think it's super interesting. Thank you. Um, and then Kayla, for you, if I can ask you a question, um, I was glad that I was glad that Nick is kind of in your field because I'm because I'm like oh, I do not know <laughs> a lot of what's happening here, um, but I do but I do know is that my best friend, um, her parents were in this very situation. Um, is that her father had a stroke um, and did have extreme. Uh, was nonverbal and had extreme difficulty um, eating and had to be fed by caretakers, right? So this this situation, um, exactly. Um, and her mom was the primary caretaker until he passed away about two years ago for for about 15 years. Um, so this, this, I think this falls a little bit more in the sort of kind of qualitative um, social relations kind of world. Um, but I'm curious with your findings from your work, um, if some say someone approached you and they were like, "Hey, you've done all of this research. Would you be willing to put together, um, you know, a, some some guidelines or some sort of takeaways to pass on to people who might find themselves in this caretaker um, situation? What do you think, based on your research, would be interesting to kind of pass along to people, kind of the more layperson?" Yeah. Well, um, my grandparents went through this almost exact scenario. Um, for about a decade. And I think like that anecdotal experience mixed with um, this research, I've kind of, it seems like one of the main important things is making sure that both the um, stroke survivor and their um, primary caregiver still have access to social supports, whether that be family or friends or um, other people, even like their therapists and things like that, who are able to validate the problems that they're having and not um, kind of downplay them just because they're not experiencing them themselves and to make sure that both people are still um, kind of communicating to each other about what they're, they're experiencing as their own challenges um, as a caregiver and as someone who's experiencing disability. Um, and without those conversations, it, like my research has shown, like there's a lot of um, mismatch in what people think their partner is experiencing and what they think their caregiver is experiencing, but they're not, if they're not asking and they're not having that conversation, they won't know um, what that experience is like, even though they live with that person every day. So. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. I think I actually just remembered based off uh, my conversation with Kayla for our first group of presenters, did you also see, I think an unequal distribution um, between genders from your responses? Is there a majority, one way or the other? What was that? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I have a question for our first group. For uh, oh, for yeah, the first group. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, from our first group, did you see an unequal distribution in genders from your uh, survey respondents? No, um, not really. Well, oh, sorry, go ahead, Brian. Go, go ahead. Uh, no, oh well. Um, <laughs> there, go, go. Go ahead, go, go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> Fine. Um, for me, what I could find, like, um, there really was no um, 
no distinct correlation. It does not correlate. There's no like one side away. I I believe it was kind of equal because the way because the way how I think Claire mentioned how like the way how we de- distribute how we deliver the surveys out was so that anyone can take the surveys. So and so reflect so reflected upon that. Um, I I think we're I think we're fifty fifty on the genders and all that. I could be wrong. Um, but but that's what I think. All right, Claire, now you can go. Um, well, I mean, like, we definitely have a lot more, um, females, like, answer our survey, um, but I didn't really, um, from, like, the actual survey questions, though, um, it seems, like, I didn't see, um, really, like, females, or, like, if females or males, like, be completely on one side of the scale or versus the other side. I think it was just like personal experience rather than like um, gender specifically. Yeah. Oh yeah, I guess that was, would have been my question was whether or not there was a difference between the two in survey responses, but so there wasn't a difference. Between them. No, and especially like with my data and like the way I had it categorized, like one of the males like um, answered a one and one of the males answered a four. So there's really like a wide, like, yeah. Um, range of answers that can't really like correlate necessarily with one gender or the other. So can I ask a question for the first group? Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw y'all a curveball. So if you don't if you don't have an answer for it, I totally understand. Um, but I'm kind of just thinking about this panel. I was helping. Um, I also helped put together some of these panels, and we were kind of trying to find these sort of common threads that ran through all of the presenters. Um, and I do feel like a big one that we that we touched on that I think maybe the first presentation is really kind of this umbrella that holds like people come from all different places and all different backgrounds and and genders and linguistic you know backgrounds. Um, so in, in a way, you're kind of like the large piece that holds these studies within them. Um, I'm wondering if your if your findings or anything you heard from the other presentations um, kind of thought you thought of something and you were like, hey, our study kind of has some implications for these other presentations or like, wow, I would really love to see how our research fits in with this piece. Um, so a big question that requires some critical thinking, but I'm really, I'm really just curious if anything came up. Um, I think, <laughs> okay, so now you um, go. I think with Maggie's presentations <laughs> I think with Maggie's presentation specifically um like kind of just looking through the lens of like a video game like character like you're looking uh, you're playing the video game through like a, a character or um yeah like someone like that and I think our research like personal background like it kind of relates to how you um act in that video game or like basically just how you interact with like maybe other gamers through that video game or something like that so I think specifically with like Maggie's research, I think that kind of aspect relates to that. Yeah. I definitely would agree too. Cause like me personally, I don't play video games. So this was like really, really enlightening for me. It's just like, oh yeah, that does have like implications of like you te- you're confined to like a s- story space, but also like every single person behind that controller is different and they're going to have different like perspectives on like what's happening. So I think that's something that's really interesting and could definitely be under the umbrella. Yeah, and I guess to kind of delve more into that, um, yeah, because a lot of people have different reactions. Uh, not, not that a lot of people do have different like, um, yeah, reactions to certain things depending if they do certain activities like play video games, play sports, and all that. And like for me, like, like I I don't really play that much video games. I'm starting to get into it playing a whole lot more now because I mean why not? Because with this whole pandemic and all that, I mean I, I'm having a lot of free time. So, but but. But it is interesting for me because uh, I'm playing like a, a good variety of games and all that, and I'm getting different um, reactions to to a whole lot of them. And and I, yeah, and I guess to kind of like build upon more what Catherine and Claire said, um, when it comes to video games or the type of it, um, all the type of things to do in the world and all that, it would be interesting to kind of delve more into those and just see how those affect like the four topics that we that we talked about earlier. Um, because well, yeah, because our our presentation does. Um, it, it does kind of in a way it, it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt as well to kind of have more of the topics, other that yeah, other topics to talk about to kind of elevate more of our, of our research question, like essentially how does your background of this certain topic affects like the social outputs. So yeah, I, I guess it would be 
So I guess those will be interesting topics to kind of delve into in the future. Um, and I think with like Kayla's research too, um, just like dynamics of like caregivers and like the um, patient, I mean, for lack of a better word, patient, I guess. Um, I guess it's just like, I mean, of course they're like, you guys are, I mean, they're couples and it's like you maybe live under the same house and like you feel like you know each other, but also there's a time where like those two people were like, um, I mean, they have, they live separate lives and they come from different places. And I think that kind of social aspect and social dynamics of caregiver and patient also apply to like our study applies to that too. Yeah. And just to like follow up on that, I think that like, because they do come from like different places, like they're, they come with like different values. And so like, it could potentially like vary depending on like what factors they relate with. And so that could have affected as well. Um, okay, if we don't have any more questions, um, I guess we do still have a little bit of extra time, but I don't have anything else <laughs> for us as of now. Um, yeah, thank you again to everybody who came on to this session to present or to uh, be a guest. I'm glad we were able to create <laughs> a little virtual community to keep this thing going. Congratulations, everyone. Seriously, impressive research. Obviously, so much work went into everything that you did. Um, exciting to see all of the places you can go. I think that's the best thing about research is it's always just a, a way to open more doors in your mind to think of different connections. And one of the best ways is, is talking to people um, inside and outside of your discipline. So I love that this panel got to get together and do some kind of intermixing uh, of different thoughts. So it's really, it's been such a pleasure uh, hearing all of you speak about your work and you should, you should just be so proud. I'm proud of you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, people, you're welcome to <laughs> hang out with the, <laughs> with us for a little bit longer if you want to, or, um, I'll, uh, just let people go. Have a great rest of your day. I'm going to be the first to head out. Thank you all so much for allowing us to present. I appreciate all of this. Yeah, thanks to you too, Maggie. Of course, you all did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Wait, so can you guys like, are you guys going to send like a link to us about like the, the, the videos or this recording or towards just finding normally just in YouTube? So I know that, um, the symposium is going to make them all available. Um, I do think they have, they're gonna have so many. So I'm not sure exactly what their timeline is, um, okay. but I think the symposium organizers will kind of make that, will post them so everyone can watch them and make that available probably through the symposium mm -hmm. website. But I also imagine you'll get an email too. Does that sound right okay. to you, Nick? Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, you guys. All right, thank you yeah, so much. Thanks, you, thanks, you too. Have a good day. Bye. Nice job. Yeah, you too. We did it. <laughs> yeah, we did it. I know. I was a little worried because I was like, oh, no. Us. We're going to like, oh, oh no, yeah. our last person is oh. now here. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Hey, Nolan, are you there? Or no? Um, maybe I can send a message in chat. Yeah. Hey, Nolan, is your mic able to be turned on? Um, I think, yeah, so we had the session from 10 to 11.30 today. Um, is that what you had on your schedule? I was just going to drop in on the 11.35, and I was making sure that this is the right link. 
um, is, and I assume everybody's going to join in at some point. Um, so we had the session from 10 to 11.30 just now, actually. Yeah. Uh, how'd it go? Oh, it was great. Um, you were slated for this section, right? No. Oh, okay. Oh, I was... uh, that makes sense then. Yeah, because we had you on the schedule from 10 to 11.30. Yeah? Um, uh, I had the schedule uh, starting at 1.30. Ah, uh, Okay. So, so you're at 1.30, you said? Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, let me just double check this the schedule here and make sure we're all on the same page. But I have a friend uh, presenting at 11.45, so I thought I'd just make sure this would work, which is why. Right. Okay, yeah, that makes sense then. I think our schedule was not up to date then. It's, but it seemed, that seems possible, because I'm like, uh let's see what well, nolan will you tell me the name of your um the name of your presentation yeah it's phase one of a curriculum uh, for anxiety yeah. okay give me just a sec but i was also in a poetry presentation but i wasn't allowed to present because i had a different representative Yeah, give me give me just a sec. I think there it looks like there was some mix up on our schedule. So I just want to extra triple check that you we make sure you're in the right spot. Okay, thank I you. I believe I believe in you, but I just want to make sure I'm. <laughs> I feel good about it. <laughs> I had a conversation with um, what's her name? There's Christabel and Jessica. Um. JC, there's a bunch of people working on this. Who the heck is everything? Yeah. Well, I had a uh, talk with Jessica, I think, and um, we scheduled it for 1.30 because okay. 1.30 to 3.30 three time slot and I have a class of two. I see. Okay. Oh yeah, we can probably stop recording also. Oh yeah. <laughs> I guess we probably can. <laughs> yeah. Um okay. Uh, this is so frustrating. Okay. Well no when did you talk to Jessica? Yes uh two days ago. Two days ago. Okay. I'm guessing yeah because I'm also not seeing you as being part of our panel on this Trello board which makes me think we got moved and it just didn't update our schedule. Okay, well I say, okay, 1.30, 1.30, 1.30. Yeah, I kind of, I didn't see my name on here, but I just assumed these were larger categories and I was a subcategory. This is the link for every meeting though, right? I think, yeah, I think that's why it's kind of, everything in this um, room I think is going to be, yeah, just throughout the day. So it's kind of going to get reused. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, I trust that you are in the right spot. Um, and I will, I'll just extra triple check with um, the folks who are putting together the schedule, but it sounds like if you talked to Jessica recently, that's probably right. Um, but yeah, if you don't hear from us, that's a good thing. And if you do, do you use um, Microsoft Teams? Yeah, it was through Microsoft Teams. Okay, yeah, then I will, I'll let you know if I um, see anything differently in Microsoft Teams, I'll just give you a chat. I'll, I'll come on presenting at 1.30. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for popping in. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> I guess we got that figured out. Yeah, that's good. That makes me feel better. Yeah. I was like, this is gonna be really awkward. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Well, I think, I think we're looking good. And um, yeah, it was great. Great moderating with you. I think it went really, yeah. really successfully. And um, it was fun. I love doing those kind of Q and A's and stuff. Yeah, it was fun. It's good to have some more like face to face interaction. Whatever you can Seriously, do. I know it's like so nice to think about things that aren't my projects. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. We'll take All care right. and enjoy yeah. the rest of the symposium. Yeah, you too. Bye.